Hi world, this is a frugal millennial and today I'm analyzing top mistakes people make when they are doing property research. And the things you could do better to better use your time whilst researching. When I first started out as a property investor in 2014, as a buy and hold investor, there were some questionable things I did when I was doing my research. As information was scarce back then, I had to learn the hard way. So I really appreciate it if you could take some time to like and subscribe to my channel, as I hope my mistakes can be something you can learn from. For those new to my channel, I make videos on all things finance from how to invest in US stock market to non-fungible tokens and to property investing. Cheap is sometimes nasty. When I first started out, my first instinct would be to find a fixer upper to fix it because fixing it meant I could generate instant equity. And these surely became one of my favorite types of properties. And I suffered tunnel vision for a few years as I would use the price sorting button on the property search sites as if it was my lifeline and find the lowest price properties and solely look at those. Although there's nothing wrong with this mindset, for a buy and hold investor, there were other factors I need to consider. What is neighborhood like? Is it close to public transport, shops, schools? Is the property structurally sound? Is the rental yield here good? If I'm holding it, will there be potential growth? My first property, although bought at a very discounted price, was located next to a privately owned recovery house. This was not publicly known back in the days. We only discovered this when we moved into the property and there were a lot of promotions in the middle of the night. Although the property was structurally sound, close to schools, amenities, but it was very far away from public transport. And we've done work since on the property it is not an experience for the faint-hearted. The only saving grace that the property has provided me with equity to buy other properties and the current rental return is great. Some streets are better than others. This ties in with the first point. We all know there are good suburbs and bad suburbs, but did you know that sometimes within the suburb there are bad streets and good streets? In some really high-end suburbs of Sydney or Melbourne, for example, there are pockets of commissioned housing, which can drive down the price. To overcome these aforementioned issues, you need to do your due diligence. As mentioned, it is paramount to look at where the property is located next to. Two similar sized houses are rarely the same price, unless they are located right next to each other and they are those cookie cutter houses. The price of houses could be influenced by being located right next to the freeway or train tracks, for example, which can bring down the price. In contrast, if it's located next to a scenic feature, schools, shopping centres, it could bring the price up. If you don't mind living in a house right next to the freeway, then by all means go ahead and buy the property because you might be able to get a great discount compared to a similar property a few street away. However, think about when you resell the property. Would everyone agree with your mindset? When purchasing a property, inspect where possible. I'm a firm believer in this, even though in my last purchase, I did buy a house without looking at it. But I was in the area a few weeks before. I then hired a building inspector to have a look at the structure of the house. Only when he gave me a stamp of approval, then did I purchase the property. If I like an area, I also do a simple search on Google. You'd be amazed at what turns up in forums. I love using Homely to see if the suburb is livable. On Homely, people rank the suburbs through their own personal experience of living there. And it tells you things like demographic, personality, things to do, etc. Median price is not a great metric. Unfortunately, most of the data given to us on Australian websites such as realestate.com, domain.com, rev, read is median price. The median price is obtained from getting the middle value of a group of value. In this list, for example, you have 
properties worth of 100,000, 150,000, 240,000, 300,000, and 380,000. The median price will be 240,000. It is literally the middle figure. Median price is better than the mean price because it doesn't skew your data. But by using this as a metric to measure house price is flawed in numerous ways. It doesn't tell you anything about the spread or what the lowest or the highest values are. Just look at the previous example. You will think most of the houses in the suburb is around about 240,000. Although there's a difference of $280,000 between the largest figure and the smallest figure. This will only work if there's homogenous properties or very similar properties within the suburb. But most of the time, this just isn't so. Median price is not a true reflection of the trend in the market. For example, if you had in one month average houses for sale, the median price is $350,000. And then the next month, you have five above par houses in the same suburb, which brings the median price up to 800000 Then you would think your $350,000 house has increased by half a million dollars, but that is not the case. This is especially true in the current climate, where there's a scarcity in properties, and there are not many listings each month. Median price doesn't tell you anything about the land size. When I looked at properties in Asia or America or Europe, a lot of the prices are in square meters or square feet. This is a better indicator compared to median price. If you look at the house price in Australia, there could be a large variation in house price based on the land size alone. To overcome these flaws, there are a few things you could do. Always look at how many properties is in the data set. And this is especially important in times like these, as mentioned before, where property is in short supply. I was recently on the REIT website looking at median house prices and noticed that they were reporting the median house price for five to seven properties, which were listed in that month in a particular suburb. This sample size is not significant. In fact, basic statistic dictate that you need a sample size to be about a thousand for it to be significant. And sometimes these areas don't have that much data for a long time. So you need to look at the long-term trend. For cases like that, it is best to look at quarterly trends or yearly trends. Look at the spread of your listing by comparing the cheapest and the most expensive. If there's a large difference in price range, do not use the median price to compare things. Work out the price per square meter or square feet and use that as a comparison. This parameter is a better indicator of how much properties are. We are comparing apples with watermelons. Two similar houses on the same street can have different price if there's an easement going through one and not the other. So make sure to ask a real estate agent whether there are any easements. By law, they should tell you whether there are. Or if you don't want to ask them, look at the section 32 or the contract of sale to determine where there are easements on the property. The best practice is go through your contract with your solicitor or conveyancer. There's no point comparing a house that has three bedroom and two bathroom with a three bedroom and one bathroom. Unless the two bathroom is the same price as one bathroom, then it might be a bargain buy. In Australia, a lot of the data is presented as median price for houses and units. The unit category is very broad. These are inclusive of apartments, which doesn't make sense because units are usually only one or two levels. You don't get neighbors on top or below you. And sometimes you even have your own private courtyard. Whilst apartments are mostly multi-level, most of the time you get neighbors either beside or above or below you. So again, only make comparisons according to type, size, maintenance fee, other outgoings. But last thing I'm going to add is when I do my research, I make sure to look out for extra features. Sometimes there's an added study, attic or rumpus room, which is not stipulated as an additional bedroom in the sales. This might be a cheaper option if you were looking for a three bedroom, but found a two better to be cheaper, but it comes with an extra room. 
I purchased a property which states that it's a three bedder, but had an extra workshop converted into a rumpus, which they mentioned way down in the description of the listing. Had you skimmed through the listing, you might have missed it. Similarly, you might pick up negative attributes about the property that doesn't show up on the listing. A family member nearly bought a house that was 20% cheaper than the houses of similar size in the area. Only when I took a closer look at the contract did I find that the house was zoned as an industrial area, hence deemed non-livable and should be used for commercial purposes only. So always do your due diligence because buying a home will be one of your most expensive purchases ever. Before I go, I'd like to thank those who have supported me in the past by liking my video, visiting one of my socials or using my referral links for free money. Your support has been tremendous and much appreciated. I hope you can continue the support so I can make more videos. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching.